Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, May 8th, and this is the weekly market update. Again, the disclaimer, it's not investment advice. Anything that you see or hear here is just my thoughts and opinions and should not be taken as investment advice. Please do your own due diligence. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So before I get into the reality check, somebody sent me a, well, I sent out a tweet talking about how exciting things had been in the resource markets recently and how fun it was kind of, it's kind of fun, you know, when things are going the way you want them to go or going in your direction. And somebody said that, uh, well, it'd be really great if you talked about, you know, some of your returns. I don't really like to do that. I don't like to, because you can be up one week and then down the next week, or, you know, it's just, I don't know, it seems a little tacky. I will say that we are beating the my, my, um, market averages. If you want to look at the S&P 500, we're beating that quite substantially. Uh, there is a big rotation happening away from a lot of the tech stocks. A lot of the stocks that I think have benefited over the last five years or so, or especially, you know, technology and all these companies that are like growth stocks. And we are seeing a rotation into value and into things like the resource sector for obvious reasons. But uh, yeah, I don't want to really get into, you know, yeah, this is my top performing stock. And I mean, I might do a forensic on some of these after I sell them and, and talk about why I bought them and what the thought process was, but I just don't want to get into that. I will say that, you know, we did have, we, last week was a really fun week. I mean, uranium really busted out pretty good. Uh, we continue to have great news in the uranium sector, which well, I will highlight in another slide, some of the, you know, it just seems week after week, we're getting tremendous news there. Um, a lot of the commodities are really performing. Copper's making new highs, ag prices, corn's like over $7 a bushel. There's a lot of, lot of stuff happening. So um, we were positioned early in these things. We took a lot of flack because we did not, uh, you know, you, you get in early, you have to get in early for these asymmetric type situations. I remember talking to Trader Ferg on one of the interviews we did. And I remember buying Paladin while we were talking uh, during the interview, we were uh, talking off camera about it. it was selling for like seven or eight cents a share. So where's it at now? You know, 50 cents, I don't know can't remember top of my, something like that. It's up tremendously since then. So, you know, getting into these things and having to sit and wait a year, two years, that's how you get the real asymmetry. Now everybody's pouring in. Uh, yes, there's more of a move to come, but, you know, the move from, you know, 10 cents is different than the move from 50 cents. So still think there's tremendous opportunity there, but just wanted to, uh, to uh, highlight that. So anyways, yeah, I don't really want to get into that, you know, too much. Um, I think a lot of the people that are in the newsletter so far, I mean, have been satisfied and uh, continues to grow. So if you're interested in that, uh, feel free to take a subscription and uh, give it a try. All right, let's get into the reality check. So it's kind of funny. I mean, there's been the last couple of weeks this discussion specifically around the economy recovering, things reopening, businesses reopening, industries reopening, travel, all these things. And what we're seeing now is complaints by businesses that um, they can't get enough people to come back to work. And why is that? Well, the reason why is, is because people are sitting on their butts at home, making more money on unemployment and benefits that they're getting from the government. And so, as Charlie Munger says, show me the incentives and I'll tell you the outcome. If you pay people not to work, then they won't work. And this seems to have gotten by the administration and the officials in the, but I don't, in the government, but I don't think it really has. I think this is part and parcel of, you know, um, the agenda and the agenda is to redistribute wealth, to have more of, you know, the, the fruits of the economy go to labor versus capital. Uh, I'm not saying that that's, you know, that that certainly has been the case. Capital has enjoyed an advantage over labor for probably the last 30 or so years or more. And, uh, you know, Biden's build back better. He talks about that. 
you know, blue collar jobs, union jobs, all this kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party is full on board with MMT, giving people stuff. You know, I read an article in the, I think it was the Washington Post talking about, it was actually a pretty good article. It was talking about this landlord. He was an immigrant from Guyana and he had came here basically with nothing. He had saved, scrimped and saved. And he had like a, I don't know, a half dozen rental properties in some city up north. And obviously, you know, when the pandemic hit and the government unilaterally put rent moratoriums and he could, he wasn't allowed to collect rent. So he was, you know, I mean, this guy's losing everything. And um, then it showed the other side of the renters, you know, the, trying to dodge him, hide out from him. Some people would try to pay him like 20 bucks a week or something, anything, you know. Um, but he was still responsible for the maintenance. He's still responsible for paying the taxes. Uh, you know, he's still responsible for the mortgages on these properties, but there's no rent coming. You know, um, this is something that's not being discussed, right? And so the government just says, well, we'll just create another program or another policy to cover up the policies and programs and decrees that we've made that have damaged certain people. What, what I found interesting was the comment section where you're really seeing this neo-Marxist mentality. Well, if they can't afford it, that's their problem. Well, okay, well then, you know, who's going to provide rental properties for people? I mean, the, the thought process, I mean, I, I'm hoping that this is a small percentage of the population that actually thinks Marxism and, and radical, you know, socialism and communism is the way to go. Um, I, I hope this is just a small vocal minority of people, but, uh, you know, I don't really know. I'm not taking polls, but, you know, I mean, at some point you have to go back to work at some point you cannot just live on the dole at some point we you, you have to take responsibility for your life and get out there okay and uh and that was part of what i've seen in a lot of the complaints about even on twitter and some other things well if they can't afford the need to raise wages you know okay well i mean that's eventually what's going to happen i think i saw something from uh, a video from one of the fed uh governors talking about that exact same thing you know, that's the last thing a business wants to do because once you raise wages, it's not like you can cut them again, right? So um, I think inevitably that's what will happen. Wages will start going up and that's inflationary, right? And I think that's what the administration wants to see. That's what the Federal Reserve wants to see. That's why they're going to keep their foot on the gas, right? To get the employment back as fast as they can. But to my mind, you're going to have a hard time getting people off the couch if you're going to pay them to stay at home. They just won't, people won't do it. People, you know, are, are not going to work for less than they can get by sitting on their couch. It's just that simple. Incentives matter. And so you have Yellen, you know, who's the Treasury Secretary and was a Fed chairman and is actually trained in labor um, economics. You know, she says that she doesn't think unemployment benefits are hurting hiring. I don't know if she actually believes that, if she just says that, or she's just dumb. Who knows? I mean, but this is, uh, this is the mentality, right? And so you have this, um, you know, transfer of wealth. It's not really a transfer of wealth, though, because the money's just being created out of thin air to pay this. It's not, you know, we're talking about raising taxes now. I don't know. This is just, uh, I don't see how this is going to end well. But anyways, you know, the Fed and the U.S. government are trapped. It's kind of good that Trump didn't get reelected, because when this thing falls apart, it's going to fall apart on the Democrats' watch. And, um, you know, I mean, we're, it was funny. They had a, they had a picture, um, this week, I think, uh, Biden and his wife, Jill, vi uh, visited Jimmy Carter and, um, Rosalind Carter, you know, they're in the nineties. And if you remember the disaster that his administration was and took us into the, you know, stagflationary late seventies, you know, where you had to have the emergency Volcker to come in and crush inflation. We had a massive recession in the, uh, 80, 81. So, yeah, I mean, the past is prologue, right? It, it, it could be. So anyways, uh, they're trapped here. What are they going to do? You got prices breaking out everywhere. Like I said earlier, you got agricultural prices going nuts. You've got, uh, all kinds of reports coming all over the place about prices going up and they just keep, you know, pumping money in and keep doing what they're doing. And, uh, and at some point, this is going to risk getting away from them. I showed in previous videos charts that showed um, forward-looking indicators that indicated to me, at least, that the CPI could get to 5 or 6% this year. And that would shock the markets for sure. You know, they continued to say, they being the government and the Fed, 
that this is transitory. These are just temporary shortages. They'll alleviate themselves given time. But if you start embedding wage inflation into the economy, that is not something that goes away very easily. Now, there are deflationary forces out there, right? There's demographics is out there, uh, continued uh, immigration of low-skilled labor into the U.S., um, technological advances. So these things are constantly wrestling with each other. I don't know how it's going to end up, but what's happening right now, uh, I think, is is very, very concerning. So what's 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 the market to do raise rates uh they've given no indication that they're going to raise rates and i think that there will be some discussions around you know trying to jawbone the market down you saw that little brain fart like last week where yellen came out and said that maybe rates should go up i don't know if they just do that stuff temporarily to try to take some of the froth off if they're they may just be that stupid i don't know and don't think about the consequences of the things they say and do it's hard to say so and you've got you know you know after this jobs report this this week wasn't that good you got biden out talking about more stimulus right so uh you know you got full mmt in effect so i don't i don't see how you know the current trend that's in place how it doesn't continue for some time at least you know i think we're going to be shocked when we see like how high some of these commodities go like copper and uh some of the you know food prices and you know i don't think oil's really had its big move yet and i think that's coming and we'll talk about that later on in this uh, episode. So again, you know, this is a chart off Twitter. This is talking about the conference board, jobs, plentiful jobs, hard to get. Um, NF, NF, National Federation of Independent Businesses, small business job openings hard to fill. I mean, this is off the chart, right? They're having a hard time filling job vacancies. Why? Because like I said, people are sitting on their butt making, you know, nobody's going to come out and work for nine fifty an hour if they're making... 20 bucks an hour, 15 bucks an hour, sitting on their butt, getting unemployment or whatever. And all the other benefits, it's not just unemployment or a stimulus check. It's a lot of the other benefits, rent moratorium. If you're not having to pay a thousand dollars a month for rent, because there's a rent moratorium, you're not going to pay your rent. If the government says you don't have to pay it. Same thing with mortgages. Now that stuff's all building. Tremendous pressure is building. These, this isn't going to go away. What happens when the moratorium ends and you owe $15,000 to your landlord? Then he, then you're going to have all these mass foreclosures and evictions, or is the administration going to step up and, 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 and extend the moratoriums and cause even more dysfunction in the economy? You know, what about the landlords? What about these banks? You know, what happens with them? Or is they just, are they just going to paper over and just bail everybody out? I don't know. It's a possibility. But you can see this is exactly what we're talking about. You know, U.S. job openings through the roof hard to fill. I mean, here it is. Here's the data. So uh, it's not being made up. So here's a tweet from Jesse Felder. Inflation is coming. The number of mentions of inflation during earnings calls. This is, you know, companies have their earnings calls. We're doing the earnings call earnings season. The mentions of inflations during earnings calls has exploded more than tripling year over year per company so far. And the biggest jump since Bank of America started keeping records in 2004. I mean, I'd say, I, you know, this is like this kind of another indication that doesn't exactly follow 100% correlation, but it, it correlates pretty good. So we have this inflation rate down here. And, you know, this is the previous data. This is off the hook. This is off. The, this is we're seeing charts like this all over the place. And everybody keeps saying, don't worry about inflation. I mean, if we <laughs> so th this even if this got to five or six percent inflation, um, you know, look at back in 2008 when we had another, I think inflation got to like four and a half percent when oil hit $138 a barrel. You had the uh, mentions of inflation and then the CPI, you know, got above four. And that was a big deal, right? We had a big crash on account of that after that, after the Fed raised rates. And that was the housing bubble. We're seeing, we have more bubblicious conditions now. I mean, this is frightening. Shift over to our uranium. I mean, I talked about it before. A lot of the uranium stocks, again, are on the move again. A lot of good news this week. You know, we talked about it last week. Sprott's going to take over and create, uh, turn UPC into the Sprott Uranium Trust. It's going to trade on the NYSE. It's going to be an at-the-market vehicle. That means money comes in. They can, uh, you know, buy more uranium. It's going to be actively managed. 
What's interesting is UPC went ahead and uh, because of the NAV is so much higher than the market price. There's, it's positive. Uh, the price, I mean, is way above the NAV. Uh, they went ahead and did this uh, $50 million offering, which they're going to use for um, buying uranium and general corporate purposes. And it's funny, the next day they upsized it to $70 million. So the demand's there. So I think that, you know, when this Sprott vehicle comes into fruition, when it uh, the deal closes and they get this thing up and running, I think tremendous amounts of money are going to flow into the sector. Um, uranium price is, you know, back over $30 a pound spot. And I think that, uh, this is going to be one of the, probably well, in retrospect is probably going to be one of the biggest catalysts to really kick this thing off. You know, tremendous amounts of tinder and dry wood have been piled on this funeral, on this, on this bonfire that we have been getting ready for. And this, um, this announcement of this Sprott Uranium Trust, I think, is the match that's going to set this thing off. Uh, I will also put a link here to the Cameco had their conference call for the first quarter. You can read through the transcript. I'll put a link to it. I uh, just I, normally I do a full blown review of it. I don't really need to do that anymore. I mean, things are kind of moving in the right direction. I just wanted to cherry pick a few things out of the transcript that I found interesting. A couple quotes from Geitzel. And, and Grant about uh, the uranium price and the market. Uh, quote, I have to say that over the course of the last few months, there has been nothing to dampen our enthusiasm. And in fact, there have been a number of developments that continue to support our optimism, unquote. Uh, that's what we've been talking about here. I mean, this is, uh, the news seems to be coming every week now, good news. Um, Another quote, demand for uranium is rising at precisely the same time that supply is becoming less certain, unquote. So they talk about uh, uncovered during the, trans or during the conference call. They get into a lot of things we talk about, about the amount of reactors coming online, um, the extension of reactors, lives, uh, uh, everything in the market. It's a, it's a pretty good uh, full-blown review. And, but I just thought some of these tidbits were good. I mean, there was a discussion about uh, the inventory in Japan. You know, the J Japanese reactor restarts haven't happened as quick as anybody thought they would. And so the question was asked, you know, is that inventory available? And so they, uh, they said the following. So we look at that as probably the most mobile source of utility inventory. But I can tell you we see no indication that it has been mobile. And they go on to say is like, you know, I think they've asked the Japanese about it. And they, they're like, why should we sell this uranium at, you know, a cheap price and then have to come back and buy it at a higher price a couple of years down the road? So that makes perfect sense. This was one of the bear cases that was out there that, you know, Japan was going to liquidate its inventory. It was a big source of mobile inventory. And it seems like coming from the Cameco, at least, um, I'm sure they're out beating the street for every available pound that's out there to fulfill their contractual requirements. So. Um, I thought this was interesting. Uh, they did have a mention. Somebody asked them about the uh, what's going on with the Sprott Trust, and they had the following to say. Because I think there's a really important development in our market recently with the folks at Sprott taking over the management of UPC. I think there's just tremendous potential upside there, and it really comes in the form of bringing in an experienced professional manager in the physical metal space to bring active management truly into this. I think they've involved a group, very credible market liaison, some folks that Cameco knows used to work for us. And so we think that brings instant market credibility to what they're doing. So again, you know, um, they think there's tremendous upside there. I think there is too. Everybody does. So every, the stars have aligned. The train is leaving the station, has left the station. Um, money's coming into this market. The bull market is on. Buy on dips. That's my advice. Uh, I'll keep reporting good the positive news any bad news that comes but uh we're in a we're in a uranium bull market there's no doubt and uh i think it's going to exceed the previous one uh for many reasons so uh yeah uh it's going to take a couple years but uh, if you hold on and buy on dips i think that you are going to do very well so i thought this was interesting um the rig count not sufficient to prevent supply issues maybe even as early as later this year so we've seen that, you know, Brent is pushing close to $70, WTI is $64, $65 a barrel. 
And you can see this rig count's really not moving that much higher. I mean, you see the uh, total OPEC plus rigs and then everywhere else rigs. I mean, it's it's actually down. It's 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 moving down. So we're not you're not seeing a response to the higher prices yet. That was one of the fears that a lot of people had. Well, once oil prices get up to sixty, seventy dollars a barrel, there's going to be this uh, rush of rigs, and we're going to uh, return to an oversupplied market. It's the same thing here. This is the U.S. rig count in black. I mean, and this particular person uh, is Open Insights. They do a lot of the forecasting on oil. I mean, this is like you need to get up here to, to get to the, well, here would be to just to hold to production flat, you need to get to this level, which is slightly above 450 rigs, probably close to 500 rigs. We're not anywhere near that. Yes, it's climbing, but it's not to the point that everybody thinks uh, what's going to happen or thought might happen. And we're nowhere near um, getting to levels that were pre-COVID, which were putting shale production into growth mode. So we're well below the area, the the amount of rigs that we need just to hold production, U.S. production flat. And nothing's even happening really overseas. It's just flat and, and declining. So this bodes well for the oil price longer term. Um, I did see a good argument made about um, the bear case on oil demand. Um, maybe it's what we've seen as far as opening is the best we're going to see, but that doesn't really matter, right? We don't need to get back to hundred million barrels. You know, Jim Rogers used to say this all the time. Um, if supply is shrinking faster than demand is shrinking, you'll still get a higher price. And I think that's going to really be the story is people are focusing too much on demand on a lot of these commodities and not necessarily on supply. And there has been, as we've stated since the inception of this video, channel, there has been a tremendous underinvestment in all resources, and now it's coming home to roost. Um, it would probably be better for everybody if we didn't get back to the previous levels of demand for oil, because we certainly will have an oil shock. But I think we will. I think oil prices will continue to grow. The economy will continue. Economies around the world will continue to open up with some hiccups here and there, and oil demand is going to come back. And um, contrary to what everybody thinks and the underinvestment and the lack of new production, which is being indicated here uh, is going to come back and bite everybody. And, you know, I think at some point down the road, we see well over a hundred dollars a barrel again. That's just my opinion. I don't know the timing of it, but the underinvestment, the lack of investment is going to eventually be a problem. So again, with the food prices, um, here's the UN food world food price index. Um, blue line is the index over here on the left and the, here's the year over year change, right? So we're up over 30% year over year. You can go over here to the right-hand chart. You can see the, uh, various, uh, different, uh, categories of sub indexes. They're all moving upwards. Uh, oils are moving the highest, like soybean oil, palm oil, that kind of stuff, but they're all in, uh, tremendous up up cycles uh, going at 45 degree angles. And this is a concern of mine. Uh, I'm going to, you know, veer off a little bit here and do a little bit of an editorial. Is anybody noticing the extended winters that we're getting here? Um, is anybody paying attention to what's happening in Europe? Um, is anybody starting to wonder what's going on? You're not, it's not being reported on the mainstream, but you know, you're getting record snowfalls and record amounts of cold. I'm talking about going back hundreds of years anomalies okay and we're seeing more of this why are we seeing more of this because we are entering a grand solar minimum i know people think that that's conspiracy they think it's tinfoil hat i encourage you to please go back and look at the mounder minimum and these previous times when we had grand solar minimums that doesn't mean we go into a new ice age what it means is is that the amount of solar energy amount of so you know production from the sun it goes down OK, and that's really what the regulator of temperature on Earth is, you know, without the sun. This would be a frozen ball of ice. So not taking into consideration what the sun is doing, I think, is, you know, at a minimum short sighted. And, 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 and you know, it, it's just ridiculous not to even consider that. And to looking back at previous solar minimums, which we are entering one now. 
NASA is even forecasting that. Various entities are acknowledging that, but nobody's going to tell you this because it doesn't fit the agenda, which is CO2 is going to destroy the earth. Give us your money and wealth and give us your rights so that we can run the world. Okay, you can't regulate the sun. The sun's going to do what it does. You know, you can't tax uh, the sunspots. So uh, this is going to be more of a problem with the supply chains that issues we've had with food prices going up. And then over time, which is what I believe is going to happen, you're going to have short and growing seasons, right? On the front end and the back end. It'll be taking longer to get your crops into the ground or you get them in the ground, then you have a late frost and it kills everything. So you got to replant. And then on the back end, you know, things uh, get your growing season shrinks a week or two on each end, your yields are going to go down. And we've had a, we've had an abundance, as I've said before, for over a decade of optimum growing conditions because it's been warmer. And if we don't have that, what's going to happen? Are we going to be able to produce enough food for everyone? So I think this is an opportunity and people are uh, not paying attention. Somebody asked me, one of the subscribers asked me, how can we don't have, you know, I've been recommending fertilizer stocks on these videos because they correlate very well with um, food prices and grain prices. It's one of the ways just blanket take advantage. But, you know, I can only put so many stocks in the portfolio and I only put like one a month in there if, and it takes a lot of research. So, you know, don't uh, just hold yourself to, you know, what's I say in the newsletter, if there's other opportunities, then you should look at them. But the whole commodity complex is going up. You know, and another thing is you need to understand is oil is a big input and natural gas are big inputs. Energy is a big input into the agriculture we do. You know, just buying oil stocks that are very undervalued basically gets you chips on a lot of these themes. So, yes, you can drill down and buy, you know, the fertilizer stocks. There used to be an ETF, right? They got rid of it. I believe they got rid of it. So um, that just bought fertilizer stocks. But there's only, you know, a handful of major fertilizer stocks. It's not hard to figure out which ones to buy. And, uh, you know, I think this is going to become more of an issue. You know, there's more talk about, you know, you're going to be eating bugs and that stuff. Uh, I didn't share any of the articles this week, but I run into them. You know, this trying to move the Overton window and the discussion to how great it would be if everybody eats bugs to fix the climate. I think that there's quite a bit of the elites that know what's going to happen, that there's going to be issues with resources, that there's going to be issues with food. They're trying to spin this. They've, uh, you know, trying to use this COVID uh, lockdowns and train you to uh, behave a certain way so that when these real crises manifest, you've already been trained to stay in your house. You've already been trained to uh, do what the government tells you to do. And, you know, in order to save the planet, you got to start eating grasshoppers. We, you can't eat a, a ribeye anymore because it harms the environment. I mean, and people believe this stuff. You know, the, the, this global um, warming climate change is a secular religion for people that don't believe in God. It's just that simple. You know, Chesterton said, I've said this quote many times, I'm paraphrasing the quote, people that believe nothing will believe anything because you have that the human being is created with that desire to believe in something bigger than himself whether it's whatever it is a cause a god whatever mother earth whatever it is so if you don't have a god to believe in you're going to substitute that you're going to make an idol of your choice whatever appeals to you and for many people that's you know, environmentalism or walking around with two masks on and yelling at other people that aren't wearing masks and all this kind of crap. So, um, you know, psychology plays a lot into this. It's really fascinating to watch how this is uh, played out and how this is setting up. You know, uh, a lot of people don't like me talking about, you know, grand solar minimums. They think it's crackpot stuff. I'm just telling you, you know, if the global warmest and climate change, uh, extremists can talk about every time there's a heat wave, then I can talk about what's happening with the cold waves. I mean, we're going to have a massive cold Arctic blast, I think this weekend in the US, in many places. Is there any discussion about, you know, how anomalous that is? Or, you know, that actually, it's starting to get colder now, over time that that's what the satellite data is showing. They're not reporting that. 
but it's out there. It's out there. Uh, it's not some guy in a basement doing it. It's straight from NOAA and NASA. They put the, they put the data on their website. Nobody bothers to go there and look at it. Certain people do, but you know, it's it, the data is out there and you know, we're not, we don't, we have a lot more people than we had during the last time we had these big cold spells where we had smaller growing seasons. You know, as I've pointed out before in a video, maybe two years ago, you have a one and a half Celsius degree change in the average temperature down. You cannot grow any grain crops in Canada or North Dakota, Minnesota, these places. What do you do then? Biggest crop in Canada is canola. So this bear is watching and this is going to cause, as I've said before, if this food price inflation continues, it's going to cause political, social, and economic uh, upheavals. The Arab Spring was not caused because people in Tunisia and Egypt wanted democracy. The food prices were up 40, 50 percent. That's what caused those riots. You know, we talk about inflation. People talk about why hasn't gold done anything? I don't know. Is gold finally reacting? I mean, let's be honest here, guys. This is, uh, I like this. I, I got this off uh, some other, somebody else's analysis, but it's good. You know, I have a 30-week moving average here, okay, in this blue line. And so, you know, this thing was just creeping along, right? It kind of follows that 30-week 30, 30 um, uh, moving average. And when it gets substantially high, like last August above it, you need to correct back down towards it. And so you overcorrected. Now you're coming back and you've broken above it. Notice that when you break above you know, the trend usually stays intact. So what do we have happening here? We have, you know, the moving averages are crossing over into positive. Okay. That's on the histogram. That's something I like to see. Same thing here. You know, when this thing peaked and the black line went under the red line that, you know, stayed in effect, same thing. Now you're having a trend change possibly. You see an RSI relative strength index moving above 50. That's potentially bullish. Okay. So uh, at some point, you know, if we get the inflation, I think, and they're not going to raise rates and real rates are going to continue lower, then that's a catalyst for gold. And um, this is kind of, you know, we were buying gold stocks back, back in here. We were talking about buying them and uh, you know, it's hard to buy when, you know, everything else is going up, but I like to buy things that are out of favor. And uh, I was adding uh, to, to gold stocks back, back in this time frame, And now we're, uh, we're, we're inching up. So, um, uh, we'll see what happens. It's not uh, set in stone, but, uh, this looks positive. This is a positive development and gold seems to be, uh, slowly, but surely sniffing out the inflation that's coming now. Again, I'm not convinced fully hundred percent that the full blown inflationary from deflationary mindset has changed. It takes time for these things It's a phase transition, if you will. But, uh, you know, all the, all the things are moving in the direction of more inflation and, you know, gold's not necessarily the best inflation, uh, protection against inflation is typically industrial metals and, and energy. So, but gold, uh, gold will have its day in the sun. And, uh, I believe that, uh, you know, we're, after this, you know, basically nine month, eighth month, basically consolidation. We're ready for the next big move higher in my view. So we'll see how it plays out. Uh, and, uh, yeah. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Um, lots of things happening, lots of good stuff happening in the portfolio and the newsletter. Um, uh, I think right now, uh, since in just this quarter, we're, we're, we've doubled the, um, we're, hundred percent ahead of the, uh, not, a, I shouldn't put it that way. Our returns are double what the S and P's return. So, uh, I don't like bragging about it cause things can change, but I think we're on the right side here of the, uh, boat and you're seeing big sell-offs like in uh, a lot of the growth stocks. I only had that Kathy Wood on last week, CNBC, and she was trying to bail out the water in the ARC funds. And that thing looks like it's rolled over. A lot of these bubblicious stocks, a lot of the growth stocks, a lot of the high PE, you know, to the moon. We've seen this before, 1999, 2000, 2008, rinse and repeat. So I like, like I said before, my, my key to success is uh, sell overvaluation and buy undervaluation. On that note, uh, I just got another report from 
the fund in Uzbekistan, and that is just going great guns. It's still tremendously undervalued there. The big money has not come in yet, but uh, I mean, the fund was up like over 10% last month, and it's been consistently up this entire year. Uh, I'm really happy with what's going on over there, and uh, the reforms continue. The liberalization of the economy continues. Uh, capital will continue to flow into places like that. Uh, you're seeing that here in the U.S., right? Capital is leaving high tax, high regulation, goofball places like New York, Illinois, California, and going to low tax, low regulation places like Texas, California, or Texas, Florida, Tennessee, places like that, Nevada, Idaho. Uh, people are not going to just stay around and get, uh, you know, I mean, like I said before, incentives matter. So that's kind of the whole theme for this week's video. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Appreciate you uh, participating. Thank you for supporting the channel. Thank you for supporting me. And uh, throw your questions at me and uh, look forward to interacting with you in the video comment section. That's it for this week. We'll talk to you next week.